So smart contracts, I think, are really what's going to change the future. NFTs will be part of it, but I'm trying to sell my house as an NFT. We're live. What's up, buddy? Hey, Mike. So who am I talking to today? So I'm Drew. Drew Podrabaric. Now um, say that last name again. Drew Podrabaric. Podrabaric. Yeah. Did I say that right? That's right. I just know you as Drew. I never even knew your last name. That's funny. Podra Beric. Yeah. And what is that? Yeah, uh, they tell me it's Croatian, but really? I but I don't know that for sure. You ever been to Croatia? Not yet. I used to live in Europe though. You did? Yeah. Where? So my wife and I got married uh, at nineteen, pretty young. I was nineteen, she was twenty. And uh, three weeks later we moved to France and joined a surfing mission group. <laughs> wow. And it was awesome. So um yeah, we used surfing as the tool to share the gospel. Oh, wow. Yeah, me and my buddies, uh, we, we all we are, uh, ride longboards, so we can catch like 100 waves when everybody else is catching, you know, five or seven. So what we would do is we would catch the waves to start and then let people go and just yell out in French, like, go, go, go. And uh, they'd be like, why are you letting me? In French, what does that sound like? Uh, well, what would I say? I wouldn't speak it in <laughs> French. <laughs> everybody else would. <laughs> Um, I actually told people I hate French so much. It's like my least favorite language. So I refused to speak it over there. Wow. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I can't remember what it was. But it was cool because people would be like, you know, why are you, uh, why are you letting us have these waves? It would be like the wave of the day. And it would be like a beautiful transition to be like, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you the gospel. Let me show you what love really is. Um, so, yeah. I was really close to Croatia, but I've never been there. That's so. funny. Croatia. We want to go there. Uh, I think the place is beautiful. Um, yeah, it looks pretty. Yeah, I want to go to Italy. There's a lot of places. I, I've never been to Europe. I'm supposed to go in a month, maybe two, to uh, Germany. I'm supposed to be going to Stuttgart. Why? Uh, one of my buddies uh, that works for Expel, uh, his name is Claire Brock Chris. Um, him and Dwayne that run the OEM uh, department at uh, Porsche. Yep. in uh, Germany, they are doing uh, paint protection, the clear film, mm -hmm. on uh, the Porsches right at the manufacturing plant. And in the world of my space, of what I do for a living, yeah. I'm pretty quick and I'm pretty knowledgeable and uh, I've been doing it a very long time. So, And I like to travel and I have a presence. So I guess as a coach, they want me to come over there and kind of help speed up and train their staff. Oh, nice. Um, so at I'll the be Porsche plant? At the Porsche plant. Nice. Which will be cool. That will be cool. Yeah, I'm excited. We've been texting dates back and forth. They shut the plant down. Or not shut it down. Maybe they just temporarily shut it down for a little while with the Ukraine thing. Yep. Production's been low, and they're trying to ramp it back up there in the next couple of weeks. So the end of April, 1st of May is what we're looking at. Maybe go over there and then go to London and then Paris. Um, oh, we'll do awesome. some advanced paint protection training. Um Chris uh, West is his name, and uh, he's like a world-renowned paint protection installer. He's like one of the best in the world. And uh, Is window tinting big outside the United States? Uh, I think so. Um, I mean, I went to China, and, man, they were tinting cars everywhere. They were paint protecting cars everywhere. Um, I mean, China is kind of what we were back in probably the 70s and 80s. Like, they're just now having a middle class hmm. that can afford cars. And so everybody that's making money over there now is buying cars. Interesting. And now they want them Americanized, like tent, paint protection. But right. I did find out when I was in um, Guangzhou that all the people that do paint protection, it's kind of like a condom for a car. And I know some of the people in the industry don't like me saying that words, but it's, it's a plastic wrap that goes around a car. Right. And it protects the car. And in my mind, the only thing I can come up with is that people understand a condom as protection. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, right. So I just say that word. It might not be the right word, but, um, but anyway, they park so horribly in China that everybody basically hits each other when they park. Really? So the paint protection is eight mils thick. And if it gets dinged or scratched or whatever paint to paint, it doesn't damage the paint. So they basically wrap the entire car, but they have a huge labor force compared to what we have over here in the U.S. I mean, I had found out in one of the, 
I guess it's called Expel. Every store over there is called Expel, but it's individually owned, kind of like mini franchises, I guess you could say. It's like a territory, and the guy gets his own building. Sure. These buildings are immaculate. I mean, I'm talking doctor's offices, and there's 20 people all over the place sticking stuff to the car. And there is a full-time videographer, camera going around. They have drains in the floors. They have lighting that is state-of-the-art. Um, I mean, these facilities would be $2 million in the U.S. Wow. And they're doing five, maybe ten full cars a day. Is that a lot? That's a lot. That's a lot. Most paint protection shops do a car, if, if there's two installers, in about three days. One car in three days? In the U.S. Wow. Normally. If they're really good installers, you can do a full car with two guys in about a day and a half. If you're really good, like top notch. But your average shops, three days. Sometimes a week. So they've got wow. 20 people over there just cooking, I mean, just pu- pumping these things out. And uh, they're about five grand US per car. So 50 grand a day is pretty good. That's amazing. Yeah, it's unreal. I, it was, Why don't you build one here? What's that? A shop like that. Why don't you put one like that here? <sighs> Who, myself? Yeah. I would never want to shop big. They're big shops, they're big overhead, big problems. I mean, you can't get the labor. It's. Um, the business model that I have is keep the shop small and simple and put one alpha male in charge, kind of like one buck in the woods per shop. There's not, I call it one ego per shop. If you have one ego per shop, it's easy to control. That guy kind of feels like he's in control. He's got a staff that works with him. They have a good system and it's cash flow. And he's the owner? No, not the owner, but he gets a percentage of what the store does. Okay. So he has an incentive. He has an incentive to keep the guys going and then they get a profit share right off the top. Right. So it's very simple. Who does the marketing for them? Um, I do. Um, so the Sunstop- Your parent company. Sunstoppers Inc. Is um, a company. I have a marketing degree from college and uh, I just really love marketing and I love to create ads. I love to do videos. I love to keep all the guys busy. I think it's a responsibility on my end that I'm constantly fishing. So if I'm in a boat fishing for like the village, I have a village of people that work for me and I have to go out on that boat every single day and fish. Hmm. So if I'm fishing, if I don't go fish every single day, then they don't eat. So that's my responsibility to them because they made a responsibility to me. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's actually a really cool picture way to do it. Yeah, so I feel like it's a responsibility. Like if I don't market and don't market a lot, then they're not going to feed their families. They're not going to buy cars. They're right. not going to, they're not going to grow with me. How are you marketing right now? <clears throat> a lot of different ways, a thousand ways. Um, who's interviewing you here, man? <laughs> I'm kind of, yeah, I, I get it. I'm this like is, so curious though. Cause I, yeah. I don't get to sit with a lot of other business owners. Yeah. A lot of times, you know, we're always trying to be sold stuff or, yeah. or building our company. So like, I'm just curious, like how you're doing some stuff. And then I definitely would love to share how I'm doing. Some yeah. Stuff. I mean, you know, obviously the social media side of everything is kind of the, the growing trends for marketing. Um, Which ones are you using? I mean, all of the platforms, but in our world, in the automotive world, I guess you could say, there are a lot of blogs. There's a lot of chat rooms. Hmm. There's a lot of what I didn't realize early on is like Tesla forums. Okay. You buy a Tesla and these people are like Apple when Apple first came out Apple was like and I'm not going to say the word cult but right it's basically a very loyal fan base 100% 100% Apple yeah. 100% you're either droid Google or Apple there's right. no but I would probably say that the bulk of the market share in the world is Apple <clears throat> Tesla is gaining market share and their their notoriety is very similar to Apple Okay. Makes sense. Makes perfect sense, right? It's a techie company. Most mm-hmm. of the people that buy, uh, not all, I'm going to say most of the people that I've had experiences dealing with that buy Teslas are very smart people. They're very intelligent. They have usually college degrees. They come from some type of technical background. So they do a lot of things by email and they like to give reviews on every transaction. Mm, yeah. So what happens is, is that they go to a Tesla forum and then they turn around and they sell for you. 
I had a good experience, a good turnaround. I had a loaner car. It was priced right. Uh, they were very informational. And if I had a problem, they'll fix it. And so when one person vouches for a group, like say my company, Sunstoppers, then the next person that comes in and buys a Tesla that sees this guy, understands what happened, is now referred. And this guy calls me already as a warm call. He's already calling me because he's already been vouched for. It's kind of like, right, right. I value your opinion. Right. I, I respect you. You're uh, a guy that I admire. And uh, so if you were to turn around and say, Mike, I'm in your store and you say, hey, I'm going to make a recommendation of this. I'm going to value that recommendation. Right. And I'm going to I'm going to probably do it. So that kind of is that paid advertising? It's at not all? paid. None. None, is none paid. None paid. The best advertising you can get is not paid. That's true. But the number one rule of growing your business and being successful is that you need to advertise on all platforms. Yeah. All of them work. You know, when you, years ago, we used to do the Yellow Pages. You know, Yellow Pages was basically it. Wow. Back in the day, it was like, yeah, an ad in the Yellow Pages. That was it. And wow. then word of mouth. With Instagram, YouTube, um, Snapchat, TikTok, LinkedIn, uh, Google Reviews, Yelp, um, next door uh facebook right i mean you have 10 platforms right there that are just incredible platforms but they all cost money they you know any small business has a content creator almost full time now right um yeah i just hired one did you yeah yeah absolutely you know we have a videographer we have a photographer that's uh i say on staff but uh he's he's a good friend and so how do you decide if you've got a million bucks to spend how are you deciding where to divvy it up right now it's a percentage. You see the results through the analytics. And what so do you see is working the best right now? Which one? Which platform? Well, if you want a better lead, Google. When I say better, it's better qualified. It means somebody's searching for that product. It means that if I'm going to Google and I'm going to go, I want XYZ. That means I'm searching for that information pre-determined. You know, right. That's the information I'm looking for. I'm going to Google saying, hey, I want to learn more about this. I'm going to pick the top three people. I'm going to research those companies and I'm going to inquire to get a quote. When I'm on Instagram and I'm just kind of slowly sk skating through mm -hmm. and then I see a really cool picture that's like catches my attention. I'm going to go, oh, what is that? And then I realize it's an ad. It's sponsored. And I go, what is that? And I click on it. Next thing you know, it's got information of something that enticed me. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, 100%. So Facebook is a small what I would say 10, 15 second video. I would say you have to have very good photography for Instagram. Like you have to have a really cool photo that catches people's attention. Yeah. Instagram's photos. Facebook is videos. Google is content. Google ads need to have a message. We fix this. Hmm. We solve a problem. So in Google, you have to be able to solve a problem. Like what's your product? What's the problem? What are you trying to fix? Interesting. Does that make sense? Give me an example, if you don't mind. I have a roof leak on my house. Is your roof leaking? That's the ad. Uh, Got it? So yeah. you have to have an enticement. like um, Deemed car. Lose weight now. Right. I guess you're fat. Yeah. You want to lose weight. Right. So you need to um, have a message Interesting. that is marketed to the customer that is fulfilling a need. You said you just, so I'm, I'm going to make notes during this because this is how I learned. Well, you can watch the, the YouTube video. I know. Um, <laughs> so that's interesting. So you're saying Google, you're fixing a problem. Google, you're fixing a problem. And you're advertising, or, but you you're can. Fix, or you're, you're solving a problem through a need. So I need my yard cut. So right. if you go, or if you need your yard cut right now, you're looking for a landscaper, you're looking for somebody to do edging, mulching, and everything. What would you do as a consumer? Google it. You Google it. 100%. Right. And then what would you Google? Uh, lawn care around me, something like that. Yeah. Right. Need my lawn cut, okay. whatever. So one key ingredient on marketing is by the domain name yardcarenearme.com and right. have it reroute as a landing page. And right. then you will basically own all of those searches. Hmm. Smart. That makes sense though. Those are the, we yeah. have window tinting near me. We have... You know, Charlotte window tinting. We have window tinting Charlotte. We have Sunstoppers. I have a hundred domain names. Right. And they're all pointed to Sunstoppers. Right. So it increases traffic. 
that make sense? It's awesome. So if you're wanting, you know, any type of thing that you're going to market, you got to go and just basically draw a big circle around it and build layers of what you take to get. It's almost like the shotgun approach versus the sniper approach. Right. As I've been in business for many, many years, I like the sniper approach. So what means I'm going to sit in the woods 300 yards away and I'm going to wait for the right opportunity to act. Hmm. And then that's going to get me a better customer. That's going to get me a loyal customer that's going to buy more services from me. So I got a guy that wants a, a nice house that wants roller shades and blinds or window tent in his house. He's going to usually drive a nice car. And when I'm there, I'm going to turn around and talk to him about tinting his car, paint protecting his car, and ceramic coating his car. So he's going to be what's called my quadruple whammy. Right. He's going to buy all my services. Right. Does that make sense? So I would rather find the better quality candidate who lives in a nicer area, more intelligent, who's going to do his research, who's going to turn around and vouch for me right? and turn around and give me all his friends. Right. Makes total sense. Total sense. Um, do you get subbed out for your window tinting? Not uh, anymore. I used to years ago when I was younger. Because I see the liquor business. I mean, they are always having somebody tinting something somewhere all the time. They are. So oh, as far as like the know. ABC stores? Well, no, South Carolina, all the beer companies, they're paying for the the new Budweiser bottle to be put on the side of the window. Oh, yeah, wraps. Wraps. Yeah, I got you. So yeah, I didn't know if y'all did that for them. Years ago, I used to do, I dabbled in a lot of different things. Um, I just decided to be good at the things that I'm good at, like one or two things, be good at those. Right. Because you take your eye off the ball, and you're not paying attention to what's making you the most money. If you're looking at the revenue, you're looking at the, the marketing, market to an audience that gets you your biggest profit margin and your quickest turnaround. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you're marketing, you need a quick turnaround and a, and a good profit margin. If you're, it, it really comes down to this. My dad was, is a very intelligent man. He taught me a lot of things when I was younger. I, he didn't think I was listening to him, but I actually did. I had to listen to him. He was like E.F. Hutton. He never talked, but when he did, you listened. Uh, hello, son. How are you today? I've got something I need to tell you. That's hilarious. It was just, uh, yes, sir, I'll listen. Yeah. Um, super smart guy, but the... Um, one thing that he would tell me is, why would you do something for $10 an hour when you're making $100 an hour? So why would you cut your own grass? If I could spend one more hour at work making $100 an hour, then why would I get a lawnmower out, buy gas, maintenance it, service right. it, right, to come home and be frustrated for an hour? Yeah, unless you enjoy it, it's not worth it. <laughs> it's not worth it. Right. So I started to adapt that mindset. I mean, I would say probably in the last 10 years, but I was early on. I wanted to do everything. I was young. I was ambitious. I was um, eager. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, I got a question for you. Sure. Mike Burke dies today. Yep. What happens to Sunstoppers? It will live on through my oldest son and my youngest son. And uh, I have a good management team. Um, got some really good people with the company. That's awesome. So I think it will actually probably do better. When I die, that's cool. I'm, t I'm a little controlling, but I've let go over the last couple of years. But uh, I want to get to know you a little bit. Sorry, I like talking with you. I know <laughs> you do. It's <laughs> awesome, man. I appreciate it. The um, so you're a missionary <laughs> surfing. Let's get back to yeah, surfing. We're going, we're going back there. Yeah. I mean, it was super cool. So, what was your love for longboarding? When did you start? When did you get your first longboard? When yeah. did you? get your first wave i want so, to know when you got your first wave i was in california i was in uh seventh grade and i could not get this sport i, I mean i i suck at surfing i was so bad and i was good at like every other sport how old were you i was uh in seventh grade at that point i don't 13? know 13 12 13 okay. something like that yeah um you know I'm, I'm always the quarterback best pitcher all these things like athlete wise i was very good and i could not get surfing so i fell in love with it and uh it's taken me all over the world. I've lived in like 10 countries, what? Um, but I love surfing. Wow. So, so who has the best waves? Mm, that I've been to, uh, probably France. Really? France. I mean, Northwestern Spain's really good. Portugal's really good. Um, I love Hawaii, but it's like the cliche place kind of. Yeah. We lived in uh, Central America for a little bit. Um, in Costa Rica. Oh, yeah. And I loved that area. That was awesome. Um, 
but yeah, I haven't gone surfing now. In so like if you were going to teach a beginner how to surf, where would you go? Um, anywhere in the world, Costa Rica. Costa Rica. So if, you, if I'm a newbie, yeah, we'll go down there to have some and fun. And we have a, we have a, you know some friends. We get a little group together, and you say, yeah. you know what? I'm going to give you that wave. But when I give you that wave, I'm going to talk to you about. That's right. Yeah, I talk love, about the Lord. I That's love right. it. That is awesome, man. Yeah, we had fun doing that. Yeah. So then, okay, so we're sitting in France, and we just bought plane tickets to move to um, South Africa. Okay. And we were going to go explore the whole southeastern side of Africa, like all the way up to, um, I think we're going to go, I, we might have gone all the way up to Somalia. I don't remember. But um, day before we left, the Lord said, you need to go back to America. And I'm like, I do not want to do that. But I guess I have to. So me and my wife prayed about it. We like we really felt like that was clear. The Lord said to do that. And I said, God, will you just tell me why to go back to America? And he said, I need you to go train quarterbacks and start a, uh, a quarterback ministry. So I said, okay, God, I'll do that. Move back. Or I was still 19 at the time. Um, and I just came back to Charlotte where I w- was raised and found one quarterback who was terrible <laughs> and he was in sixth grade and everybody at the time was always trying to train like the the senior or the stud or the the already in college or the pro and I just realized you know if I can just minister really well to a sixth grade quarterback right now and teach him how to be a really good quarterback he's going to be the leader one day and so this is a great opportunity so for like the first six months, I had one quarterback. I could not get any more. And I'm like, God, did is this like, is this, did I, what did are you I not? testing Yeah, here? exactly. And he was really showing me if I'm faithful with little, he'll give me more. And one year later, I had uh, almost 100 quarterbacks that I was training. And at one point, I realized I was training a sixth, seventh, and eighth grade quarterback from every single school in South Charlotte. And each one of those kids, you know, as the quarterback, they're influential. And now some of them are in high school. And I'm like, wow, I'm actually able to minister to like, you know, these 50, 75, 100 quarterbacks really well. And then they're going to go minister to the 2,000 kids of their school. And so I just saw God do like really, really cool things and love those kids really well. And now I get to see them on TV and play. And like, I'm just so proud of them. Because I, I focused on like the foundation. I always said that this is the foundation, not the finish line. Um, because I'm going to teach you how to throw and how to be a good person and a good leader. Other than that, uh, you can go learn something else from somebody else. So you were a quarterback? I was. Yeah, Where did you quarter. play? I played uh, at Weddington High School and then University of Laverne out in East L.A. Oh, wow. How did you get to L.A.? Surfing. I, I know, but the quarterback thing. Uh, I just – so I got a lot of Division One scholarship offers to go so play. you stud. I had fun. Um, <laughs> but I realized two things. One, if I'm going to go play D1 football, it's a full-time job. It is. And the places that were giving me offers, they would have like a stipulation. You can't go surfing. You don't want you to get hurt. So I said, I'm not going to do that. So I, f- I cut a deal with the school uh, that they would let me, you know, surf Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then it, it was, it was awesome. It was a really fun year out there. Um, what did you study there? Economics and religion. Oh, wow. Did you graduate? No. Okay. When, what took you out of school? Uh, I felt like. I was wasting money for the stuff that I was being being forced to learn at that point. Right. Um, all I wanted to take was economics and religion classes, and that was it. And they wanted me to take calculus. Yep. And I'm like, I'm, I'm felt, just not going to do that. I felt that way in college too. I felt like they were giving me all the things I learned in high school over again. They just wanted to make money. Right. You know, I'm in college to learn the foundation that's going to set me, you know, for the rest of my life. Right. I don't. I mean, I, reading. Okay. English, math, I get it, but yeah. when do I get to the good stuff? Right. Marketing is what I enjoy. Right. You know? Um, so you're there, and who funded, I got to ask this question, who yeah. funded all of these trips across the world? You and your wife, did y'all work? Did you do things? What were you doing? Prior to, well, prior to college, it was my dad. Okay. My dad, he just, anytime <laughs> that I want to do something, he would support me in it. Mm-hmm. Um, he's like the most generous man in the world. And so I've heard really good things about your dad. Yeah, he's awesome, dude. <laughs> um, so he would literally just say, where do you want to go? Let's go do stuff and do it together. He didn't, he never surfed. He just sit on the beach and hang. And then after getting married, uh, it was me and my wife. Wow. We, we didn't have like any money. 
So he didn't. We we rented a hostel and paid uh, seven dollars a night in the hostel, and it was disgusting. But it's all we Your had. Your wife must be a gem. My wife's amazing. She has traveled the world with you. Yeah. Lived in seven dollar. Yeah. Um, and what's a hostel? Uh, basically, like a big shared hotel room type thing. Oh. So they were very kind where we were at. They let us have our own room. Um, but everybody else was sharing like five to seven people in a room or five to six, um, and, uh, one bathroom. And there was like 15 guys and my wife and I on the same floor sharing one bathroom. I feel I'm, my wife's amazing. <laughs> I'm very grateful. Did they have toilet paper? Yeah, they did. Yeah, they okay. did have toilet paper. Okay. All right. Yeah, it was good. So then move back here, train quarterbacks that just became very, very, very successful. Um, but <laughs> this is funny. So I'm sitting on my back porch one day and, uh, my buddy walks in smoking a joint and, uh, he was like, Oh dude, I made a hundred dollars today catching worms. And I was like, bro, you're so stoned right now. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? And, uh, in Charlotte, we have, you know, uh, a really bad canker worm problem. Oh. So these worms will climb up in trees, eat all the leaves of the trees and kill the trees. Yeah. So we would put bands around the trees and catch them. And so I said, all right, you're crazy high, but let's go like at least, I almost see what you're talking about. Cause a hundred bucks, a hundred bucks right now. So I How went, old were you? I was 19 also at the time okay. when this business started okay. alongside with the quarterback business. Okay. Um, went out the next day and I sold like three tree bands, $30 a piece. And I was stoked because the margin on it for me was like literally thousand percent. I mean, unbelievable margins. So I like made like 80 bucks that day. I'm like, this is awesome. Next day I go back out and I did that for um, the whole season. So for the next two and a half months and that year I banded 127 trees. I think exactly what it was. And I was ecstatic. I made like four grand in a couple months and I was really stoked. And so I realized, Hey, this could be a really big business if you did, if this was done right. So I went to my partners, the guy who introduced me. I said, do you want to like build this thing legit together? He said, no, I don't. I said, okay, can I buy you out? <laughs> he said, yeah. What do you think? I said, I don't know, a hundred bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and this last year I banded almost 5,000 trees. Um, this past year? Yeah, this past this past season. So you have a business now doing that. Yeah, that's, that, that business blessed me tremendously from a hundred trees to now it's, it's huge. It's the third largest tree company or tree banding business in the nation. Um, did, did, did you just say the third largest the, tree banding yeah. business? That's because the there's only like 30 of them or 50 <laughs> of them, <laughs> but I'm very grateful and proud of that. So, so I how tried, much is a band? Uh, up to $50 a band. Wow. Yeah. And there's a team of people out there doing that? I have uh, two full-time employees okay. and then about 20 like random kids all hired and to where go do they it. do it at? All, all around Charlotte. Just Charlotte. I built the business based on um, knocking on doors, but it wasn't like viable. It wasn't, there's no volume in it. So then I saw like, you know, golf courses, apartment complexes, shopping centers. So I might be interested in talking to you about that. Awesome. Yeah, I think I'm and I'm in on this banding business. It's an awesome, awesome business. Because so mail the bands to the client. No, we go put them on, take them off every year. Oh, there's so it's the residual. Catch. There's the catch. Yeah. Take them off, put them on. Every year is fifty bucks. Every year, and per then, per band. Per band, and you keep these bands. Who makes them? Throw them away. You throw them away. Made out of a plastic wrap. Oh, they're plastic wrap. Are they mm -hmm. sticky? Uh, I have a proprietary glue that I use okay. that I had made out of um, Canada. And Canada, it's the only other place that there's a really, really bad, uh, canker worm problem in like the whole, I guess they are States up there. A whole state will ban trees up in Canada. And so there's probably a hundred thousand tree bans on trees in Canada right now. Wow. I just don't want to go deal with the cold. Otherwise I'd where go else there. is there a canker worm problem to Charlotte and the whole U S Southeast is bad in like general. Florida? Um, it can be Georgia. It, it, so again, it mostly affects trees where the leaves fall. Okay. And so oak trees are very prevalent in Charlotte. Okay. So, yeah. So Virginia? Yep, Virginia. It's, so, so who's doing Virginia? So that's where that business made me a lot of money when I was really young. And I was very fortunate and blessed on how I 
did different things financially. And so I went to my dad and my dad was older or is older. Um, I said, dad, do you want to retire? And I'm 21 years old and I don't have to work. Do you want to go enjoy life and I'll take over your company? So that's how I got involved in liquor A lot of business. people don't know what your dad's company was. Yeah. So my dad's company is a liquor store um, in South Carolina, right over the border. So and you have it's North. Called, it's called what? Southern Spirits. It's amazing. It's Thank one of the best you. stores on the planet. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm a loyal customer. I know you are. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the reason I'm sitting here right now. <laughs> no, um, it's that was a cool company. So he had this vision um, 23 years ago. He was living in um, Matthews, North Carolina at the time and would always have to drive over to like Carowinds area to buy liquor. There was no liquor store. So he said, I'm going to build a liquor store here on 521. And uh, everybody told him he was crazy. He literally built a liquor store on a cow pasture. Nothing else out there. He had the very first retail license 23, 22 years ago. Um, and it turned out to be not crazy. <laughs> Yeah. So. And, and the thing is, since you guys opened, I know there's two liquor stores within five miles of you. Yeah, now there's seven. Seven? Yeah. Wow. And you're still busy. You're still kicking all their butts. Um, I don't really view them as competition. Okay. Why? So I, if, I'm, if I have to see competition, it's North Carolina. Right. My competition is I'm selling things, the same thing the government is selling. And so I know I can do it better than the government. And so I'm marketing and focusing and on. When you say government, if people don't understand it, listen to this. North, North Carolina, Carolina is, is, is a yeah, strict state. Yeah. You can only buy liquor from the government. Which is in the North state Carolina. of North Carolina. Correct. They're, in North they're Carolina. The government. Correct. Not the U.S. government. Correct. Right. Yeah. Um, just as bad, but. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We can go there next time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's my competition. Right. And so I focus mostly all my advertising in Charlotte area because why go somewhere you, where you can have a selection of a hundred items when you come to my store and have 5,000 items? Yeah. I mean, your store is amazing. I mean, you got stuff that most people don't have. Yeah. You know, I get my tequilas, um, you know, whiskeys. I mean, you just have such a huge selection. Thank you. How long did it take for you to get that large of a selection? When my dad first started, <laughs> I think we had, uh, a, what do we have? Maybe, 500 liquors and so just building blocks over time we're about 5,000 different liquors right now okay. um and so you have it's, wine too yeah wine huge and beer. wine yeah i've got 10,000 different wines 10,000 yeah wow <laughs> a lot That's of fun. money a lot of money tied up in inventory so <laughs> you can give me a ballpark if you want to yeah what is an average inventory look like i'm, I'm just curious what's a an inventory cost I try to keep it around 1.5 million. Okay, so you, at any given time, mm -hmm. you have 1.5 million dollars of cash sitting in liquor bottles and wine bottles. It, state law, you cannot buy anything on credit, and so everything wow. has to be prepaid. No way to come in the store. So everything setting on myself is paid for. Wow, that's incredible. And that's a very interesting, I guess, conversation I have with banks when I'm looking to do appraisals and or just deals. I'll ask them. I'm say, do you? On, your, on an appraisal, are you going to take into account my inventory? Because some places would on like equipment or other things, um, equipment businesses. But every bank's a little different. That's kind of been fun and so interesting. why would you go to a bank for any other thing? Just to get a line of credit or to look for other opportunities? or Money's cheaper to borrow right now. It is. I mean, so with inflation and everything, I'd rather borrow money. Did you buy your dad out? No. No. We... We have a really awesome working relationship. Um, so you just pay him a shit ton of money and say, thanks, Dad, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> one way to put it. <laughs> yeah. he He's incredibly sharp for being 73 years old. Wow. Um, and so he still comes to work hungry with ideas. and He still works? Not uh, really. No, I mean, it's your story, come basically. to work. Yeah, he, every time I go in there, you're in flip flops, a t shirt, <laughs> yes, looking like you're surfing. Yeah, um, he sold some properties that he was working on at the beach, and so brought them back here while he's developing down there. And so he'll hang on the office two or three days a week. Right. Um, in South Carolina, if you are one minute late on sales tax, they can charge you 50% uh, fine. Wow. 
And so I've got sales tax of almost a hundred thousand dollars a month and, uh, sales tax. Yeah. And so the state loves you. Yeah. (laughs) What's the state doing for you? Anything? That's right. (laughs) Getting away with my ideas actually. Um, but he, my dad grew up from nothing literally on food stamps. And so to where, what he's built now, he's still very, um, overwatches and make sure everything's going great. Right. And I hope he does that forever. I hope he's 95 years old, still in the store yelling at me over something like, why is the trash can full or whatever it is, right? Like, I hope he's always there. Um, cause again, when your competition is the government who lacks so much innovation, that's a great opportunity just to have so much fun with innovation. Right. I say aviation, I think innov- innovation. Innov- yeah. All right. So I got one question. Yeah. What is the most expensive bottle of wine number one yeah split question yeah and what's the most expensive bottle of liquor in your store that you have had to pay for uh the most expensive okay the most expensive one that i actually took out cash and bought it just because i really want it right then and there um even though i already pre-do that so that's a different thing uh ardbeg 19 was my what f- is it ardbeg 19 what is that it's a peated whiskey it's like 300 dollars a bottle so it's not nothing crazy wine i love really good champagne so i opened a lot of good champagnes yeah but you've got bottles in there that are two thousand dollars sure yeah but what i mean i'm just saying like your most expensive bottle of wine that you're selling to the public Mm -hmm. what would that cost like what's that that's a thousand dollars a bottle for the wine okay what do you Um, sell it for i sell it for a thousand okay so yeah. you, your most expensive bottle of wine in your store right yeah. now is a thousand. And then right now in the store for a bottle of liquor is, I just sold it, so it's not there, but it was a 40 year old scotch and that was $4,500 a bottle. 4,500. But, so this is kind of, I do want to go down this path with you a little bit today with, do you know what NFTs are? I do. Okay. Well, I'm learning them. It's, it's, it's like a, it's like an art. Uh, it's like say I have a Nike shoe or something and I want to take a digitized photo of it and then it can be sold as that's the art and I'm a, not like a medallion, but more like in the taxi business, mm-hmm. you know, the medallions, yeah. I, I kind of classify it more like a medallion. Does that make sense? It means you have the right to, to be a taxi driver. That right. medallion's worth money. Right. I look at the NFT similar to that. Am I wrong? I think you understand it a lot better than most do <laughs> getting on the front side of it. So okay. it's, I, I do believe it's going to change our life, okay. NFTs in general. I just tried to buy um, an $88,000 bottle of uh, super rare bourbon. What they're doing, they sold five the, of them as NFTs. So you bought the actual NFT. The bottle stored in a secure warehouse in Singapore. Whenever you want that bottle, you then trade in the NFT or burn the NFT, and they send you the bottle. Wow. Or I bought the NFT for the rights to that bottle, so then I can go sell that NFT later as an investment, For go sell 80 it. grand, 60 grand to somebody what, else. Whatever. There's only five of these bottles. Who turned you on to that? So one of my buddies I'm going to meet after this, actually, he's a, one of the wiser minds as far as software developing and just on the forefront of a lot of things tech. Um, he's been begging me to start selling NFTs or develop an NFT project and so many layers uh, like two years ago before NFTs really like it actually 2019 shit. So three years ago, I finally listened last year. I said, I'm going to do this thing. So January 1st, I announced my NFT project for state of South Carolina and it's been, it's on hold and I can't really talk a lot about it because the department of revenue asked me to pause it. Um, but NF, like I'm, you can put anything, uh, I want to sell this table. I'm going to take a picture of this table, sell it as an NFT. And then that table doesn't have to move until the end user actually wants it. So it's a, that's very interesting. It is interesting. A lot so, of champagne houses are doing that right now. So where is the holding house of this? Like, where do you go? Coinbase or is it a Robin hood? O- open seas.io is the largest NFT marketplace right now. So they hold this. It's like the Facebook of, it's like a Facebook market. They're just the exchange. It's like the stock exchange. Kind of. Okay. Online for NFTs. Correct. And yeah. Kind of like, they- kind of like a Coinbase for cryptocurrency in general, but okay. it's a open seas, just a different exchange. Yeah. And do, you, do you think this is going to catch on? I think it's going to be unbelievable. 
uh, I know guys, um, actually guys that we know together, um, who they are going to start listing their cards as NFTs yeah. and selling their cards as NFTs. The car's never going to leave his garage. Somebody's going to buy it. You might want to buy it because he's going to sell that, that car for hundred grand. But you know, in a year, things gonna be worth one hundred fifty thousand. He's going to leave the car in his garage. It's going to change everything. That's crazy. It means you're going to own stuff without owning it, or you can barter and sell it next time to someone else. Correct. But it's your if it's in his garage, it's, you own it. Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be in his garage. I'm looking at building a NFT storage facility right now, to where somebody wants to come. Um, they have a super rare Pokemon card. They want to come put it in storage. I'm going to issue them an NFT for it. And that's their access ticket to actually grab that thing and take it back. How do you create an NFT? Uh, I don't know. My developer does it. <laughs> <laughs> I just tell him I want an NFT to look like this or do this and he'll make it. I need to talk to this guy. It could even just be a picture. I need to become an NFT. So people are selling. This is interesting. Uh, NFTs are going to change NCAA football. Big they're, time. They're going to change what? NCAA football. Oh, wow. Big time sports. So people can sell themselves as an NFT to some extent. What they could do, and this is like very far-fetched, but I don't think unrealistic. They can say, okay, I'm going to make $100 million in my life. If you want to buy in right now, I'm going to sell 10 shares of myself at $10,000 or whatever. And they can actually do that. So in life, every time this guy makes money, he owns a percentage of what you make. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I, I want to buy you. Not for sale. <laughs> I appreciate it, though. You're a smart um, guy. So crowdsource funding NFTs is something that I'm kind of exploring right now, passionate about, because I think it's going to let the world be created in a fun way. There's a lot, a lot of people that want to invest in things. They don't have a lot of money. So you can fractionalize an NFT. So what that means is I'm going to say, I want to go build a wave park. Okay. And I, I do. I'm God, God willing, I'm going to build a wave park in you Weddington. Will. Yeah. You'll build it. Um, it's going to cost me $5 million. Okay. Okay. I'm going to sell this wave park as an NFT. And if you're one of the owners, you're going to get X percentage. That NFT is going to um, uh, produce back 20% of all sales of the wave park or whatever. Right. But I'm going to offer that a $5 million NFT. And one person can buy that NFT or a thousand people can buy the NFT. So it's big crowd source, crowd, um, sourcing fundraising. Wow. Um, but the, a non fungible token is what it stands for. But the, the beauty behind it is the smart contract. So every time that the NFT sells, whatever you've written in the smart contract, that's when the royalty gets kicked back to the original creator. That's very interesting. So smart contracts, I think, are really what's going to change the future. NFTs will be part of it, but I'm trying to sell my house as an NFT. So this, and as I say a lot of this, like I'm learning a lot of this currently, like driving here, I'm listening to things about ways to utilize this. But I think you're going to see the replacement of mortgage companies, a lot of uh, law groups, law firms. Um, so... I'm going to say this, and it's not exactly the way it happens, but it's something like this. I'm going to take my house, and I'm going to put it in a trust. Okay, then I'm going to list my house as an NFT. I'm going to put my deed and my title in the smart contract of the NFT, and then I'm going to put a QR code on my mailbox. You want to walk up and buy my house? Scan. Oh, he wants 10 Bitcoin for the house. Boom, I can buy it right now. Okay. What's, and I can have in the clause, like, oh, I have 30 days to move out or whatever. But right now, think about how long it takes to buy a house. And you got title search fees, you got lawyers, you got all this stuff that's happening. Um, and it's slow. I think, I honest to God believe that in 10 years, you'll be able to walk down your street and buy your neighbor's house right then if you want. That's incredible. That's where we're going. I think so. Yeah, the world is changing so fast. I mean, so fast. Yeah. So... When you took over the liquor store mm -hmm. from your dad, mm -hmm. how old were you? Um, take over. So, like when you started working there, I, more yeah, started so, really paying attention to the, what we're selling, learning the products. Yeah, what we did. I was twenty years old. I got in the business, um, and by law, I couldn't sell liquor, so I had to be on the beer side for the next six months. 
at that point. So I had to work on the beer side, which my beer side was not doing very much money. So it was incredibly boring, but my dad wanted me to learn everything from the bottom up, which I'm grateful for. So I, I spent, I was the beer side, then I became the beer side manager, and then I became general manager three years later, two years later. So he really wanted to make sure that I understood the business because there's a lot that goes on in the liquor business. That's it's a fast paced industry, and we why, have a lot of. Why skews. is it fast paced? Uh, prices change every week. Every week. Every week for liquor. Okay. So, like, I got an email today, and there was like 85 SKUs. SKUs. So every SKU has like, it could be everything from Malibu, and they have 12 SKUs or whatever, right? Um, so I mean, 85 brands that are all going price changing next week and the week after changes back again so i try to really overthink inventory because you want to turn inventory i don't just want to spend whatever x amount of money and buy my whole year's worth at one time i want to be wise with it so i really try to order what i need for that month or the next few weeks um and then be able to have kind of more price you get reliability a better um allocation since your dad's been in business so long and you have a better relationship with uh, the reps and the, the liquor. Do you buy just directly from uh, like the manufacturer? Like you buy straight from the guys or do you have like a broker or distributor? Yeah, South Carolina is a three tier state. So I have to buy from the distributor and then they buy from Whistlepick or whoever. Okay, so. <clears throat> California, you can buy straight from um, the producer and that makes it really fun. So that would be cool if we could ever go that route. Takes a little bit of the margin away. Margin, but then also just the exclusiveness. You can go get so much more fun, cool stuff when everybody doesn't have to be offered it. That's it. And it's just you. What's the um, most unique uh, liquor that you have that probably nobody around there has? Is it tequila, liquor? It doesn't matter. I mean, what what do you think that you have stocked or found that so like it's a gem that nobody else sourced? Uh, scotches scotches yeah so scotland has been making whiskey a lot longer than anybody else has and they have some really good whiskey that for some reason most americans just don't appreciate and i have some that are uh sourced so that means that some guy went out and bought all the juice from different distilleries as a baby brought it back to his warehouse and then raised it himself and they're just awesome they're fun unique and they're crazy so you're a big scotch guy I am. I love scotch. So if you're going to go buy one bottle of scotch, you've saved your money, mm -hmm. you've worked hard, you don't want to buy the most expensive or the cheapest, but you want to go out and buy like what you consider a really good scotch for the money. Yeah. Which one is it? Highland Park 18. Highland Park 18. I consider it a perfect scotch. And what's the price point? $150 a bottle. That's it. You stock it pretty good? I do. Wow. Yeah. How many bottles do you have? At any given time, probably... Eight. Eight. And mm -hmm. it comes pretty quickly, like when you run out? Yeah. Do you yeah. have, an, like the grocery stores, you know, years ago, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I used to have a friend, or not a friend, it was a next door neighbor. He ran Piggly Wiggly. Oh, I love that place. <laughs> you know Piggly Down Wiggly. in Charleston. I remember it first It was time. a Piggly Wiggly. And he also ran Win Dixie. Remember Win Dixie? Yeah, I grew up on Win, Dix Win Dixie. Exactly. Yep. Uh, he was our next door neighbor, and he was the manager. And I remember going there and seeing his store, and there was a huge stockpile of like a Sam's Club in the back. Mm -hmm. Like they had warehouse, like inventory in the back, like crazy. You go to like a Harris Teeter now, and there's like a day's worth of inventory. All right. So Amazon and inventory control management systems are every time a SKU has gone over the barcode of like a Harris Teeter, right. the reorder. Is, is sent. Yeah. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. So you know a lot about that. I don't. I'm just now learning it. But when people were telling me about, you know, the gas shortages and when we have, like, the pipeline that went down a couple of years ago and everybody, you know, and then we have a all of a sudden, you know, storm coming and everybody wants to go buy milk and bread, right? Right. It takes a couple of days when they make a run. Right. Because all of a sudden, it's not that the world is out of everything. It's just the fact that the way the systems are in place, that the orders, all of a sudden, we just lost all of our inventory because we didn't have a stockpile right. of inventory in the back to replace it. Yeah. It took three, four days for the trucks. And I can understand that for them a little bit because of expiration and how right. it can 
perish so quickly. Yeah. So if you run out of things, do you have an automatic system that reorders or do you personally or just someone in your company order? Yeah, my liquor manager does. So you have a liquor manager yep. that goes through and says, this is what we sold. Mm -hmm. And is it paper? Is it digital? Is it iPad? He's an anomaly. He, and who the, is this guy? Keith Hayes. Keith, yeah, I, I like love Keith, Keith Hayes. Um, I think he's one of the best in the business, not because of bias that he works for me, but I just go to liquor stores all the time. And I've seen, I've been in this industry now personally in it, in it for like eight and a half years. Um, but around it for 23 years, he just can order very, very good. It's hard to, okay. One funny thing in liquor business, you don't want to be left over after January 1st. You don't want to have any fucking eggnog, eggnog, no eggnog. Cause otherwise you're not going to sell that bottle again yeah, until, until the October next year. And so there's always this game of, you know, you're going to have, are we going to have a hundred people come in today, ask for eggnog or 500? I don't know. Um, and he, he's like, he nails it, nails it, nails it. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm proud so of him for that. You let him spend your money. Yep. He has complete. Yeah. I'm going to say complete and total inventory control. So I need to text him. when I need something. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. He, I'm going to text you. Buddy. But he has this great ability to, to respect our money. Sure. He treats it as his own. Yeah. He's not have any desire to have something. Now, is he a salaried position? He is. Do you give him any kind of profit uh, on, you know, when he does good? So like knocking out of the park, the eggnog. Yeah. Like, yeah. That, bro, and you then, killed the eggnog. We sold 402 bottles. Yeah. <laughs> we do a pretty cool um, weekly bonus program at the store. So if we have, uh, we'll say, okay, we need $100 in sales this week. If we gar grow every 10% we grow, everybody gets an extra dollar an hour. Oh, wow. And then That's really cool. um, it's different for salaried people and, and managers, but there's a lot of great incentive to, to hustle. To hustle. Yeah, because every time I go in your store, your staff is, they seem to be Johnny on the spot. They always seem to be like very helpful. I think I bought a bunch of stuff in the um, store one time where um, they one guy helped me carry it out to my car. Good. I'm grateful. My staff is literally the best staff all ever and I think part of it too is like obviously the way you treat people makes a difference sure. but also not being greedy with your money as a business owner 100% I'd rather never have to hire somebody ever again I've got guys that have been with our company for 16 17 years and they could go out on their own do whatever and they're like I make more money working with a team of people yeah. that I enjoy working around yeah. that push each other and strive for better and um I just always believe there's strength working together in numbers. You know, if I've got an army of guys, I mean, 30, 40 guys working under Sunstoppers. Hmm, that's awesome. How do you compete with that if you're one guy? Right. right. And, uh, you know, you were asking me some questions about marketing earlier. I'm going to revisit that real quick. Yeah. Well, when I got out of college, my dad um, was like, you need to go get a sales job. He said, in sales, son, he said, if you go get sales, your base of knowledge is there for life. Hmm. It's wise advice. It is very wise advice. And one thing that I will tell anyone listening, I think everyone in the world should go sell cars for three months. Hmm. And here's why. Because when you uh, are a salesperson at a car dealership, you're on 100% commission. You don't make a dollar unless you sell a car. So there's a lot of eagerness. There's a lot of anxiousness. There's a lot of, let's go, let's go. Right. Okay. One thing is that when I was living at home with my parents, just got out of college, and anyone that came in to buy a car, I would almost open the door for them. I literally would open the door. Hi, what right. can I do for you today? Right. I was so happy. We're going to buy a car today. <laughs> I was more excited than they were. So one thing I learned huh. was, when you're excited, that excitement becomes contagious. Yeah, that's true. So I would just, I turned in to become the number one sales guy at nice. the Toyota dealership. And everybody goes, well, Mike, how did you become the number one sales guy? And I said, I'm the most exciting. I'm the most excited to come to work. So when I was excited to come to work, I was motivated to come to work. And I listened to my managers. So my managers were like, get their keys. If they're trading a car, get their keys. Ask them the first second when they walk in the lot, are you trading a car? 
And they go, yeah, can I get your keys? Listen to this one. This is really cool. So you would get the keys. You would write up a little ticket and give it to the used car manager and said, hey, while we're looking for a car, I'm going to go ahead and get your car appraised. So that way we're not wasting your time. But when I have their keys, they cannot leave that dealership. Right. Until I decide I want to give them their keys back. Right. They're buying a car. <laughs> <laughs> or you're fucking walking home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not like that. But, no, I know you're not. But there, there's, there's just tactics and sales that I Smart. learned through selling cars that you right. have to create a controlled environment. Hmm. They came there on that lot because they are interested in buying something. Right. If I walk into your liquor store, I didn't walk in there just to go look around. Right. I walked in there to buy something. It's your job as the people that work there to entice me enough to buy something or more than one thing. Right. Which you do every time. 100 percent that's true you are a closer times 10 <laughs> but not just a closer hey man have you tried this see you enticed me enough but got me excited because you turned around and said you know i know you're not a big scotch fan but man you should really try this scotch over here it's like what you just said on the podcast right and i'm not a huge tequila guy but i started to get into tequilas a lot because of your knowledge hmm. you started to pass knowledge down to me and i was like oh well that one looks pretty good and then i would come in and i go what's cool What's new? What's unique? What's the latest, hottest trend? Right. I'm creating a bar at my house, and I want to have all the coolest stuff. And now you do. And now I've got some cool stuff. Yeah, one thing you said, too, that I, I, I really stress to my employees is an educated consumer is our best customer. Yeah. So we're here to educate, 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 and let them make the decision because it's not a – there's not a pushing thing. I'm not selling anything to you. I'm educating you. Exactly. And they trust you. The consumer trusts you after that. When you build that trust, it's, it's, un, I will never, I mean, if I shop somewhere else, it's because I need something cheap, quick, and it's five minutes from the house. Well, you're in Texas. Or I'm in Texas. Cause they're Texas. They have good liquor stores. They really do. I know. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't realize this at the time, but total wine yep. has liquor stores in Texas yep. and they're huge. Yeah. And they, they will open stuff and taste liquor and it's, yeah. Every, really, every state is so different. I know it's so different. But getting back to car sales, you learn what people are looking for. You learn how to steer them. Because if a guy comes in and says, hey, man, I want to buy a Camry. The very next question out of my mouth is, how much do you owe on your trade-in? Hmm. Because if you're upside down on your trade-in, I'm not going to be able to put you in that Camry if I don't ask them what payment they want a month on their car, because if they say, Hey man, I want to be around four or $500 a month, but I'm gonna go show them a $30,000 car. They're going to finance a thing for eight years at 2% to qualify for that. Right. So I can't show them a 30,000. I need to go show them a $18,000 car. So you wasted all your day, got them all hot and horny over a freaking Camry. They're ready to buy it. Then it's $900 a month or five, seven, $800 a month. I'm just, you know, making up numbers in my head, right. but it's $300 a month outside their budget. So I just got them all excited and they can't buy it. Right. So, so why do that? Why waste the energy? Right. And that takes time to learn. But when you start asking the right questions, then you can start steering that customer in the right way. hundred percent. And that's something I learned in car sales. I kind of want to go sell some cars. You really should. I think it, it'd be fun. It's actually really fun. <laughs> then I, I tried finance, which is not for me. I can't sit in an office and actually do numbers with people. Right. I, I just can't. I can get people excited. I can go wash the car. I can fill it up with gas. I can put armor on the tires. I can, you know, show them how everything works. Uh, I can hear sign here, sign here. Right. Um, but in the back, those guys are really the closers because they're the guys, what's called the box. So in the back, you got the finance department that basically tries to sell them the extended warranties, tries to upsell all the crap, and then turns around and has a buy rate based on their credit. So if you have a seven, 800 beacon, you're getting the best, you know, interest rates for like one nine and they'll try to sell it for two nine. So they'll make a point off the, the money. Hmm. Um, so you're making money on the front end and you're making the money on the back end. Well, unfortunately, years ago, uh, the internet came around and everybody knew what the price of cars were. You could shop online. And, right. and I only know this because a lot of my friends are in the car business, but I got out after about a year. I got in and got out and kind of went back on my own and started my business. Um, all my manager friends were like, Mike, you're too smart for this business. Get out. 
you, you got the bug, you have the bug. Like get out of this business. Because you work six, seven days a week. You had to pay people to do your laundry, your dry cleaning. You never had a day off. And if you took a day off and you're on commission and three people came back in to buy a car that you helped, bye-bye commission. Right. So you would talk to a customer and like, oh, I can only get in there on Thursday. Well, I'm off on Thursdays. Sorry, they're going to come in there and buy a car from somebody else. So it's, it's that sense of I'm going to lose a deal. So all the people that work there never want to take a day off. Right. Does that make sense? I've seen that, yeah. So I it's that, it's that scenario, but in the finance department, you're dealing with money, you're dealing with you know people talking about, hey, I can't afford this, and then they, there's a lot of pressure in the box. Yeah. Um, but as far as the, the money goes, everybody was selling cars at invoice, but then they turned around and made this thing called dock fees. So you buy a car and it's three ninety nine dock fee, or it's six ninety nine processing fee. Oh, yeah. And now you're like eight ninety nine. And now you're buying five nitrogen in their tires. You're buying five things, some wax they put on the car, and it's now eleven hundred and ninety nine dollars for this add on service addendum they put on the. And you're like, what are you doing? Right. Like, so I, if I was a car dealer and I was had my own car lot, I would say this is what I paid for the car. This is what transportation would be, and I need this amount of money to pay my sales staff. I need this amount of money to pay the overhead at my store. And this is my profit. And I would want to make fifteen hundred to eighteen hundred dollars profit per car. Right. And I would say this is the cost of, of what it's gonna this is what I have to make, like CarMax. You right. go to CarMax, this is the price. I don't think Tesla has ever negotiated a price on a car. Yeah, I look, you looked buy at, online. Yeah, I looked at buying one too and I, I think it was more expensive because it was used. And I was like, I don't understand that at all. Because you get it now. Right. No, it's the now. That's crazy. So if you order a car from Tesla and you build your car, there's the price. Mm -hmm. There's no negotiating, there's the price. But you know why they can do that? Because they don't have a thousand salespeople, right. finance managers, they're keeping the finance money right there because they click the finance button, right? and it's all done. That's the future of the car business. I agree. Yeah, that last is, <laughs> last time I went to a Tesla store, they almost gave me the Tesla for free because I wouldn't wear a mask to get back in. <laughs> I was like, I guess I'm just going to take the car home. What do you want me to do? It'll probably cut off automatically. It's probably true. Yeah, they have a button. Yeah, yeah no more. That's funny. GPS. I've got um, like five, three minutes. Um, okay. I got to go on. Okay. Got, no I want to um, tell a story that I sure. learned. That I know you probably have a question. Um, so my buddy went to Stanford and he would always tell me some like marketing, what's happening now. And he told me a story about a guy that came in and he was the number one um uh, townhome salesman in New York City one town year. Townhomes? Yeah. Okay. And so they did this big study on like why, how? And he said, well, it's easy. Every townhome, if it was $100,000, I'd sell for $120,000. And that markup price, I would offer um, free storage for a year and free moving up to like a 1,000 miles or something. So the perceived value was so big that he just sold so many more townhomes than everybody else. Wow. I was like, that's just a that's really cool. genius marketing thing, dude. I will tell you this, because I, I don't know if I said this in another podcast. I may have, maybe not. But when I sold cars, it was Scott Clark. Okay. Scott Clark Toyota. We were in every magazine, every, when I say magazine, newspaper. We were online. We have TV commercials and everything. Well, when you become a manager uh, of, a, of a, like a, a business, uh, like in the car business, you become a manager, you get a percentage, like a three, 4%, two, 3% as a manager right. of the gross sales, right? Right. And in the budget for advertising, I used to always wonder why he was spending so much money on advertising. I mean, this guy probably spent a quarter million dollars a month on marketing. Right. And I'm sitting there going, why? And I asked him a question and he says, well, listen, do we have good sales managers? I said, we have some of the best. I said, we have good salespeople? Yep. Do we have a good service department? Yep. Do we have a good finance department? Yep. Do we have a clean lot? Do we have a clean bathroom? Do we have a nice place? Yep. I said, are people always walking in all the time trying to buy cars from us? I said, yep. And I said, well, the mechanics work on a labor rate, 100%. They don't work on a car. They don't make any money. Service writers, you know what? Right. They, so the entire organization does not work unless there are people coming into that business. Right. So if you want to attract talent, if you want good talent, you have to advertise five times more than your competition. Because mm. what happens is the talent will find you through your advertising. Right. Because if you're a guy that's motivated and hungry and determined and want to grow, and you see the guy that's constantly in your face all the time, 
you're like, damn, I need to go work for that guy. Right. Right? Right. That's marketing. Yeah. What people don't realize about marketing is, well, you know, I'm busy. You know, we're getting by. You know, I got a lot of word of mouth. Right. You're failing. Right. The competition is going to kill you. I was spending $4,000 a week flying an airplane around Charlotte. I know. I would like to handle some of your marketing because I think it'd be fun. I think it'd be so much fun. I love it. I really do. It's fun to me. That's one thing I really do is uh, is marketing is a passion of creating something new that no one else is doing. Okay, I got one for you. Yep. I got to go. go. Um, drone shows. Yep. I think it's going to be a huge part of the marketing of our future. Drones. Yeah. Just organize. Or, um, yeah, drone shows. People, you know, have like 200, 300, 500 drones all doing floating in the air marketing for you. That is is incredible i like that idea yeah well nft that <laughs> i'll figure out a way to do that i guess it's fun and i want to thank you so much thank for coming on the show you're yeah. really an amazing man um, anybody that's in charlotte north carolina or in the surrounding areas please go see southern spirits get educated on the liquor that you want to buy educate yourself on the wine you want uh, drew is usually there he'll hang out he'll talk to you he will educate you and you have to buy at least more than one bottle when you walk in that's right thanks right. guys see you buddy Thank <laughs> you.